I'm going to launch off and I would like this to be very interactive. So there's going to be one portion where I want you to split up into three groups. Um, so be watching for that. It's not very far into the slides. I'm going to uh, show you what design sprints look like uh, as Firecat does them. There's a bunch of different ways of doing design sprints. Uh, Judy and Susan and a bunch of you have probably done design sprints and I am very interested in this being a dialogue about what are, what are the best methods. What I'm mostly going to talk about in these intro remarks is why to do it when it's appropriate to do it. So without further ado, I am going to launch into some slides. So um, and please, uh, I do want this to be interactive. The way we start, Firecat works as a user experience consultancy, and a lot of our value is delivering user experience strategy. So I wanted to ground us in what we think of as that. And there we go. So a user experience strategy has to be three things. It has to be viable, desirable, and feasible. So for viable, it has to be good for the business or it's not sustainable. We can't make money off of it or we can't save money with it. So we can't keep doing it. Desirable is where a lot of the UX energy goes. We are trying to drive adoption and make usability uh, lead. And then feasibility, you guys who are coming from an engineering or development background or DEB, uh, you're very well aware that it, unless the thing can be architected uh, efficiently and using the tools and the, the existing horrible legacy code and whatnot that we have to work with, um, we need all of these three things to intersect and we work right in the middle intersection of that point uh, for success. So what we found over the course of our careers, and I think I can speak for my colleagues that came up with me uh, over the years, if you bring UX to the table when strategy, business strategy is formed, it's a lot more effective because user experience, unless you're building something that doesn't require human beings to do a thing, uh, user experience is really important to have any traction. And then, we found that the, the earlier that we bring in and involve key partners, things just send, tend to flow better. And I'm gonna have some illustrations of that. And then the final thing is, I spent some time at USAA in a completely strategy focused unit. And one of our biggest uh, shifts in being able to deliver value was helping people connect the dots to, yes, we did this strategy, but what is the first thing I should do? And what is the second thing I should do? And how will I know it's working? So connecting the strategy to execution is super important too. And strategy isn't happening in a vacuum. <laughs> this is one of my favorite quotes. It's attributed to various folks, but I just love this graphic. So design sprints are, are very well uh, able to help you align the culture to the strategy and get some traction. So we're going to do this. Remember I told you I wanted to separate you into three groups. So you're going to pick, you're going to either be a product owner, a designer, or a developer. Just in your head, decide which one you're going to be. I'm going to talk about product owners first. There's three types of people that are really key to have involved with the design sprint. We involve other people as needed, but these three groups have to be well represented. The first one is the product lead. The person who's responsible for the thing that we're building, it has to make money. It has to adhere to a budget. It has to adhere to timelines, the financial aspect of it. Boink, clicking in the wrong place. And then the design team, a user experience strategist, a visual designer, an interaction designer, usability folks, the people that are responsible for the desirability bubble. Sorry about that uh, typo there, where, where the thing's wrapping. But um, these people are obviously critical to a user experience strategy and building anything. And then there are developers. 
So an IT architect or a developer or a programmer or a, a, a lead, they're responsible for making that critical build or buy decision. They're responsible that it has to work, that it has to be stable, always on, secure, whatnot. So you notice that these three things map to those three bubbles. And that's pretty common. So what, what I've discovered across my career is these folks often have a mindset and they think of the other people as others. And if we can get these folks together in a room and have critical conversations, everything tends to go better. We, ha we have to work together in order to deliver stuff. It doesn't happen without that. So now I'm gonna give you another, you're, you're all picking one, right? You're gonna represent one of these mindsets. There's also the, the leadership, in a larger organization especially, there's leadership that has opinions about what's going on. <laughs> so sometimes it's really important to have everybody aligned, including this person. Because these opinions, as they come through a product group, here's how that tends to look. If you don't, this is what it looks like if you don't have a, a strategy sprint or a design sprint, and even sometimes if you do. So the highest, do you, do you all you're familiar with the term hippo? Highest income person's personal opinion, hippo. So they have an idea or they've read about something in uh, Harvard Business Review or whatever. They tell the product owner, this, we want this to happen. I have this idea or we have this initiative, go make it happen. That person turns around and tells the design team, I need you to design this thing. And then the design team designs something and hands it off to the developers. That's a waterfall kind of way of things happening. But even people who are doing Agile and Lean, I, I think you'll agree that that doesn't always work out and sometimes this is still happening. But in actuality, this doesn't just go beautifully smoothly. At every step, when something's handed to, from one group to the next, there's, there's some backwash, there's some kickback, there's some objections, there's some not invented here syndrome, there's some confusion. What did you mean exactly? Or questions, did you think of this? at every step of this. So let's talk about what that feels like. For a product owner, let's, let's go back to the product owner for a minute. When the product owner is thinking about these other two groups, when a product owner is thinking about a designer, what, what do they tend to think? Who's decided that they're gonna be a product owner here? Okay. Bob, I'm seeing you. What does a product owner think about the design team? How can I get them to move fast? They're, they're gonna be the long pole in the tent from a process standpoint. And the developers are going to be the, the, the probably the, the cost prohibitive group that says we can't do that because it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take too long and cost too much. That's kind of my framework. <laughs> That's my mindset coming to the meeting. Okay. Design's too slow, development's too expensive. How's that? Anybody else have a, want to chime in there? Yeah. Crystal here. Okay. Yeah, so, so I think the product owner and having been one, it's like, oh, okay. So design team, can you go ahead and, uh, mm, not necessarily articulated, but uh, let's go ahead and design something around what the hippo would like to see. Hmm. Let's not, let's not make waves and come up with a solution that doesn't align with the hippo's point of view. Yep. Anybody else? Yeah, Susan, mm -hmm. this is Judy. Um, as a product owner, I, I, I always got the impression as a design director receiving from the product owner that um, they were waiting to figure out like, how is my design team going to uh, create what the vision that I have in my head. So um, I might give them some information, but uh, and my expectation as a product owner that they are going to create exactly what I'm envisioning. Because I communicate perfectly. Because, yes, because <laughs> I told them. And I must understand what the, what the hippo was telling me. 
I yeah. understand that perfectly too. Okay, who, who uh, decided to represent for designers? I did. Go for it. What did, what did, what did product owners think of designers? Um, usually we don't know what we're talking about. You know, you have no experience. That's not my, that's not what I've learned on the three times I've done it. <laughs> um, but you know, I would say that, you know, you're to kind of harp to your point really is I learned, I got lucky and I learned the right way to do things uh, when we worked together at, uh, that one company <laughs> at USAA where, we had a good balance. We knew that we as designers or UX folk had a say in making the product work. We also understood that the other two pieces of that were the business owners saying how much time and effort, what are your goals? And then the other being IT saying, well, can we do this and that? So I, I feel like I've been really lucky and that that's, I've seen it work that way. I think that is how it's supposed to work when it works well. That's why, because everyone is at the table at the same time, not the waterfall approach you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think Anybody it's- Anybody else want to chime in on designers? What, what yeah, designers such think a, of the other two? Yeah, the Sachin here. So from, from the product owner side, they think whatever we uh, have said it to designer, Finally, they come out with the final outcomes uh, in terms of art sketches so that whatever we will present it to Hippo and end of the day, we will deliver it to the IT guys. It should be the perfect way of uh, giving the designer. I mean to say, whenever the POs give all the information, they think we, uh, the designer will come out with the final outcome in a first go or second go and it, it goes to the development side. Probably that's the aspect in general these guys have. Probably. That's my uh, way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Especially in Agile. Yeah. Right. But you're saying that they don't understand the iterative part of that, that they're more like, oh, you're just going to do it once and we're done. You're going to make that image and we're going to move on. And anything yeah. you show yeah. them, especially if it looks complete, they assume it is complete. Yeah. And then we're yeah. done yeah, with yeah, these yeah. people. You just, you colored. You colored a pretty picture, we're done with you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. The, um, let's go on to the developer. What do the developers think of the other two groups? I can take that one. Um, I've, having worked on many teams where th this works really well, as well as teams where this doesn't work really well, um, where it works really well, the developers think um, these guys are giving me what I need, <laughs> you know, clearly articulated, and I know exactly what to go build. When it doesn't work well, which is unfortunately most of the time, uh, the developers think these guys don't know how to talk to me. They don't know how to articulate what they want. They don't know what they want. They don't know how to prioritize. They are just giving me, you know, go boil the ocean with no structure and what am I supposed to do with that? So it can, it can go both ways, right? So, but when it works well, a product owner and design team work well to articulate clear requirements and then a clear set of, you know, visual and UX deliverables to say, this is exactly what we're going to go build. And the developers have a clear path when it doesn't, the developers are constantly frustrated saying, you're just not giving me enough clarity on what it is you want to build. Right. And that's kind of what Susie just mentioned in the chat that IT is thinking we're behind schedule and I'm not going to wait for design. It's like, because well, we're they're at the end of the train wreck on the sure. schedule, right? Yeah, and, it, and Every, it's, Everybody right. crowds their time. Right. That's a really important point. Really important point. Let me get uh, back to. Yeah, that. because we all know how well that crunch in time uh, really produces an excellent product. You know? And that's the stress. It's like, no, if they had been involved and thought about it sooner, they could have said, hey, let's do it this way that we can execute in that timeline, et cetera. Okay. Well, and my, my experience has been with, with AT&T is uh, IT is the most expensive. So they don't touch their timeline. They, they get what they, what they ask for. But design is much cheaper. So design gets crunched and, and swooshed. And so then the iterative process gets attacked. And, well, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to test? Why do we have to use ability tests? And so it's, it's kind of, it could be, you know, both, both sides of the, spectrum in that respect. I agree with Bob and again, 
they ask let's do uh, give me tomorrow without understanding uh, how much time we have to take it they generally say give me day after tomorrow i need uh, i have a meeting or we have a tight schedule something like that in general <laughs> so without understanding our assumption how much time will take they generally put a, a, a deadline that we need on this day only so that can be also face sometimes it's it's very common that other groups underestimate how much time and analysis goes into a design they um, yeah. we used to have a an acronym that we threw around shut up and color <laughs> they thought look it's just <laughs> it's very simple just put the things on the page and we'll take it from here you know yeah. stop stop thinking about it so much but what what is a better way let me move us a little bit forward the design sprint is that better way where you get them all in a room and we all create the strategy together and the it goes from you, you guys probably already know but a design sprint goes from uh let's see if i've got it so they they talk in a line before deciding the solution or the scope they help everybody understand what's driving the the project and then they feel heard so what one of the things that we all enjoy is having our opinion asked before the decisions are made even if they don't go with your recommendation at least you had your say as opposed to that waterfall where you have to wait until the stuff comes to you and it the project already has momentum and there's already a bunch of people aligned and bought into the way that it has been conceived so everybody gives input early in the process and everybody buys in or at least has the opportunity to buy in. They're also able to identify obstacles. So that talking to the developers ahead of time, one of the things about the waterfallish kind of process is the developers will say, if you had only asked me about this, if you had showed me earlier, I would have told you, right? Same thing with the designers. They could say, hey, we have all kinds of user an analysis that says people won't want this if you had asked us right so this is a chance for everybody to get around the table and have those critical conversations early so here's the the basic four uh, sections that firecat can deliver this in a week it is kind of a big ask to a project team to dedicate time most of a day for four days running on the project team, but it's the best time that they could spend on an important topic. So design sprints aren't something that we do lightly that we want to do for every project. We want to do them for those bigger projects where you're trying to really move the needle. So if you were doing day for day and we can split this up into half days or even two hour sessions, if we need to depends on the, depends on the client, but you go from mapping where you you're looking at current state and then the desired future state. What are you trying to have happen? Who is involved? The user analysis part of it, but it's all very rapid and time boxed. So we iterate and come up with a bunch of ideas and then align and, and do a lot of, sticky notes and dot voting to come back together and align on what we're going to do to move forward at each stage. So you move from that understanding the problem to planning what, what we're going to go for, then making a prototype in day three and then testing in day four with real users. And then Firecat's spin on this, because I spent so much time in a, a pure strategy role and had those learnings about if you don't, get to the hardcore business value behind the idea, it's not gonna go anywhere. And if you don't get really specific about what the next steps to execution are, it's not gonna go anywhere. So we've added these three elements. Uh, this is one of the big differentiators between our method and the ones that you'll find everywhere else on the internet. We add this sort of hard-nosed business metrics layer. Um, I wanted to stop and ask Tom to give us an example from when he worked at Amazon, how this played out. So we didn't call it design sprints. Um, I was the head of UX for uh, a group in Amazon payments uh, when I first started there. And I actually launched this um, 
you know, process that was very, very similar to design sprints. What we would do is we would dedicate the first two sprints of every project to design. So two week sprints that gives design basically a four week head start on the rest of the project. So in those two first two sprints, the engineering team is off doing a bunch of back end stuff that requires zero UX, right? We got to get the databases, we got to get the infrastructure built. And then every Friday for four weeks, the design team meets with the engineering team and says, this is what we're building, right? In the first few sprints. And they have a chance to, to ask questions and dig deeper and well, does it have to be this way? Cause if we do it that way, we're going to have to, you know, really, uh, it's going to extend the timetable cause we're gonna have to build all these extra, uh, you know, backend services. And so, you know, you have four dedicated uh, reviews with engineering in the first four weeks of a project. And like I said, design is getting ahead. And so as the sprints are prioritized out, they're getting ahead on the sprints that are coming. And so engineering and design are working really, really closely to say, okay, I get it. I don't get it. You know, let's, let's dig deeper into that again with the product owner in the room. And then one of the things that I, you know, really championed was it can't just be product owner, engineering, and UX. We also have to get marketing and legal and compliance on board as well. So we would, you know, we would also have a dedicated legal and compliance meeting where we'd say, this is the high level scope. This is the high level design that we're thinking of. Um, you know, they would take it back and digest. And, and that early, early review with legal and compliance was so critical, especially on something that's, that's highly regulated, like we were doing payments and financial, you know, money movement. They were given that early opportunity to say, okay, you're going to need to do this. You're going to need to have this requirement whenever you get into moving money back and forth. And then lastly, same thing with marketing. So what happens, you know, is in the waterfall, we throw things over the fence. Marketing is the last in the line. So the product owner and the engineering team, a lot of times would throw it over the fence to marketing and say, okay, go market it. Right. And so along with the legal reviewers, we would also get the marketing team in there. So in the first four weeks, you know, not only do you have product owner, UX, and engineering on the same page, but you're also getting early review with legal and early review with marketing. So that at the end of that four weeks, um, to Susan's earlier point about getting, you know, even though we don't listen to, you know, take every single feedback, they were heard. And that being heard, that, you know, being up opportunity to say, have you thought about this, especially on the marketing and legal side, was really, really critical. Because then when we came back to them, you know, when we're ready to start really, really planning the marketing process, they weren't, you know, they weren't coming at it from zero. They were coming at it from a place of being involved early, early on. So that's, that's one example that worked really, really well at Amazon. This, you know, again, we didn't call it a design sprint. This was back in 2014. So, you know, design sprints wasn't as big of a thing yet. Um, but the concepts were all there, getting buy-in, getting coordination and collaboration with the key stakeholders early, early on so that the teams all have a chance to both react and plan. Make sense? Judy, I know you've done these, have, have some very similar stories to tell. Do you have? Sure, uh, yeah, share? I can I can jump in here. So um, I did uh, similar sprints uh, at USAA. Um, I first started using it in the bank innovation area because um, all of a sudden I went from focusing on one product to all of the bank products and I wanted to be able to address um, give everybody every each one of the products a little bit of love and so one of the things that we did we went to um, it was more of a strategy it was in the innovation so we were really focused on the upfront um, uh, blue sky aspect of um, some product development and so we set up a, a we set up a pattern of doing a sprint, um, a two week sprint, um, so that we would have enough time to engage all the business people. Uh, but we did that in a way to, to your point, get everybody in the room, um, bring out all of the ideas. And we definitely wanted to bring in the developers because one of the things that we found is that we got so much. Um, the more different types of brains you have in the room, it really lends itself to that diversity of thought. And so everybody brings their own solution making to, uh, to the opportunity. And then we get some really rich, uh, really um, uh, 
robust results in the solution options. And then we have, um, instead of you know, four or five mediocre ideas or just one idea that we're trying to tease out, we have a lot of really uh, dense, uh, good ideas that we could uh, pick the best options from many good solutions to come up with the best solution. And a lot of times uh, what I would tell the guys was, you know, we really needed to have things that all, not only met the members needs, but also the business needs, because those are the things that had the, the, the strongest legs to make it the farthest because um, it was a for profit organization. So it had to have that balance of how do we serve the members and how do we serve the organization at the same time? So um, getting all of those um, people in the same room, uh, really teasing it out, um, really helped. And I can promise you um, the, first, the first sprint that we did, um, and again, this was a, a, like Tom, it was back in 2014, 2015, um, uh, the executive that we were working for, uh, like literally told us he really hated what we were doing. Um, before we even got started, he said, I really hate this idea. And I said, okay, but thank you for giving us two weeks to test it out. And he's like, okay, two weeks, I can, I can spare two weeks. Um, and by the time we had that first executive uh, touch point, he was blown away, completely changed his philosophy, completely changed his paradigm because he was like, had never seen such great, um, like I said, robust options uh, in such a short period of time. Anybody else want to share their experience with design sprints at this point? Or do you have questions for Tom or Judy? I did a design sprint. I have recently finished a UX bootcamp at Flatiron School and the, we worked in design sprints. So we, we did a four week sprint. We had a live client to design a project for. And in that short space of time, which really surprised me, we managed to finish and produce a project for him. And he was blown away. That's cool. What was most surprising to you besides the fact that you were able to do it? Just how much you can get done in four weeks. I, I had imagined it would be, he was a startup designing an, an app for group travel. So a group of friends could all get together, plan a trip, go on a trip, share expenses, share experiences all online. And I was really surprised that you could get so much done in such a short time and Did produce a product. Did you find that diversity of opinion useful that Judy was talking about? Definitely, yeah. And what was, because my course started, it was a six month course, it started off via Zoom chat the first two months and then the next four months were in person. And just sitting across the table, bouncing ideas off each other was really useful. You can do so much, so much quicker if you're right there in person chatting to each other and just throwing ideas out all the time. Did you use sketching? Yeah, we use sketching, we use um, sticky notes, empathy maps, um, the, whole, the whole process, but just done really quickly. Awesome, that's awesome. Anybody else wanna, wanna share their own experience? I'll share one quick story with uh, AT&T that when we started um, our agile program this this is a little prior to when you all are talking about this was in 2012 and we were kind of a test pilot group we were working to redesign our contact us experience and uh, we kind of had this um, uh, design sprint grouping uh, e event well so we we actually you know flew everybody we're always telecommuting so it's we, we never have get everyone in the same room we're always on a get everyone on the same call, but this time we actually wanted to, to go through this whole agile process. And I was very skeptical because I, I just didn't think having too, so many developers, so many designers, so many business people, uh, we, we had everyone in the room, but we went through the whole process, including what 
did the business want? And we put those goals up on the wall. And then we went through, you know, the same things that you're going through, the, the mapping, the planning, and, and prioritizing and, and doing, the, doing the dots and, you know, voting. And uh, by the time it was through, we, we had an entire, you know, group of, of sprints mapped out and prioritized that the business had blessed. And it was, it was kind of, uh, uh, it was amazing. So if you follow that process, I think, and just buy into it, even if you're in this, you know, short iterative time frame, no one has that luxury. Uh, we were the pilot group. So, you know, they wanted to make it, to make it work, but, uh, <laughs> yep. But if you can just marry yourself to that process and, and give up your, your, uh, biases going in or convince everyone that that's the, that's the way to go. It's, makes a huge difference. Cool. I, I was going to just touch on these three things that we're staring at on the screen share. Um, we do a lot of work with what users need and, and doing, uh, Gary, you mentioned empathy maps. We, we uh, dive into the mindset of the users where design sprints is leveraging design thinking. And we can have another session on design thinking, but it's basically getting yourself into the mindset of the users and being very specific about who those people are. What do they think, feel, do, say, hear? And then with each, with each one of those users, in, we include, or when we're looking at users, we're also looking at internal users. So Susan Sorensen, I know you spend a lot of time with employee experience but we need to look at the experience of the entire team. You, when you're designing a, a group travel planning app, you also have to design or somebody has to design the customer service experiences that are gonna support that. And somebody's gotta design the processes. So Judy and I and Susan have all worked on service design experiences where it's like a customer journey map with the service design stuff mapped to it. So you can get you, this this stuff feeds right into those other really important UX and process engineering and prioritization. Um, we also look at any project in order to have legs needs to be that uh, viability bubble. So a lot of what we're spending time in, with in these additional uh, parts of a design sprint are talking to the, the leadership so they don't cut your project. If you have carefully thought out the risks to your approach, you'll get a lot further because you don't want to trip over a risk and some leader in a meeting is pointing out a risk and then they just redline your project. Same thing with metrics. When they ask you, how will we know this is working? You have to have a really good answer. So we make this part of our process, the users, risks, and metrics. And then the next thing we do is napkin math. We do projections. So what, one of the questions that the sponsors and the leaders want to know is, when can we expect a return? When are we going to break even? How long are we going to have to suck this up? So we try to do some napkin math projections, and I can show you some of those examples in a minute. And then like uh, Bob said and, and Judy said, um, you need to emerge with that roadmap of what happens next and what are the priorities. One of my favorite parts of a design sprint is the group comes up with a storyboard and that's where we're using sketching because it's one thing to say, to exchange words about what's going to be built. It's very much useful to get pictures on paper because it's a lot harder to misinterpret what you mean. And it, um, we have uh, team members of Firecat that specialize in visual thinking and visual problem solving, and they'll tell you about the brain science that you're actually accessing more cross-hemispheric function in your brain when you're sketching, and that it has emotional um, reach in really interesting ways. But what one of the things that we spend time on in our in our uh, sprints is having each team member practice telling the story. The larger the uh, enterprise, the more important the skill is. But everybody who's a critical player around the table who came up with the strategy, they all need to be able to tell the story so that other people who need to 
like the change management people or the process engineering people or the marketing people or whoever, everybody's hearing the same song off the same sheet of music. So I'm going to push past this stuff because I feel like we've, we're connecting strategy to execution. This is just recapping. But I wanted to show you some examples of the types of output that we've generated. Um, we do a lot of sticky notes and dot voting. So it's, it's the double diamond approach. If you've never heard of that, you go wide and you get all those I juicy ideas from a, all your cross functional diverse minds as possible. And then you narrow back down and decide which ones to move forward with. Um, lightning demos is a fun part of the design sprints. This is basically based on the AJ and smart design sprint methodology. If you have not found their mother load of YouTube videos, they're awesome. And they're also very good at teaching you how to facilitate these, but lightning demos are seeking inspiration from different places to just knock you out of the, the thinking that you might have fallen into the ruts of thinking. And then concept sketches is where we get people like engineers and leaders, product leaders and program managers and vice presidents. We make them all get sticky and sharpie and um, pieces of paper and actually sketch, even though they squawk about it. <laughs> it does activate their creativity. And then we, we get everybody does one concept sketch and it has all those good ideas. And then we can do the magic that Judy was talking about where you can say, we really like this aspect of this idea and this aspect of this idea. And we can do them both in this one thing. Then between concept sketch, uh, after concept sketch comes a storyboard and then we prototype the storyboard. And in Tom and your uh, discussion and Judy's, I didn't hear user testing with real users. Did y'all have that? We, we had usability testing uh, later on when we, um, when we had a full uh, prototype. So it wasn't part of that initial upfront piece. Again, we, we hadn't kind of embraced the idea of what design sprints have now become yet. We were you know, still kind of in the early stages of getting collaboration and a bunch of folks in, uh, to, to give us feedback and thoughts before we proceeded with the engineering. But definitely user testing was a part. It was just a little bit later down. The further road. down the road. So one of the reasons I like the design sprint methods, early testing, early, early, early prototype and test. And a prototype does not have to be a working functional software prototype. It could be sketches on a paper. It can, you can test the storyboard. You can test you know, crappy sketches. You can test, do paper prototypes where like you show them, where would you click? I'd click here. Okay. Now <laughs> here you're seeing this now what? So just testing with real users, there's no substitute for it. And the earlier you can do it, you haven't invested any of that uh, developer time, the architectural time. You can quickly try an idea and realize, Oh crap, this isn't going to work. Nobody would do this way. Um, Susan Sorensen, I know you and I have worked together to do user testing. It's a little easier when it's employees and we have kind of more ready access to employees when we're designing employee facing stuff. I know Judy, you've done that type of thing too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I think the good thing about the design sprint is there is a cadence to it. So you know when to bring the users in. You could already have the people lined up. You should know before you even start the design sprint who your target audiences. So even if it's outside the company, um, you can already have like Thursday, we're going to have people come in and try what we just did or respond to our concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you can predict when to bring them in. So uh, I would I'm definitely do it. Because otherwise it's just us thinking of stuff that we think we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. <the> public reaction. <laughs> right. I also wanted to jump in there too. Uh, a couple of things that we uh, did. Um, we did early research. So we would bring in the end users um, as part of the sprint. So we, we um, did anything to, uh, between like guerrilla testing, like taking um, a quick sketch uh, to a public place and just getting some random early feedback uh, to actually bringing in particular members for a co-creation session uh, where they're helping generate ideas at the same time. Um, and uh, then we would 
test those ideas once we got through the, the sprint and uh, came up with some testable concepts, then we'd bring uh, different members in to validate that, to really understand what, what we're doing and, and test those, those early concepts. Um, I just wanted to show you a few examples of that napkin math thing I was talking about. If you can include this type of business projections, how much are we planning to move the needle? How many people do we need to get to go do a, you know, an employee, how many man hours do we need to save in an employee facing app in order to pay for the project? When would it become kind of in the, in the green or in the black? So there's a lot of ways to do that. And that, that last slide of the four, the multi-year projections, that got a lot of attention in the ones that we've run is they, they like to see, yes, it's gonna be expensive at first, but if I invest in it, we're hoping to get this. And with your testing, you're showing that, that on average, we would save you know, six seconds a call or whatever. Or we would save 2% of calls to the customer support line or whatever the, whatever the proof, uh, the revenue or expense saving benefit is, just go ahead and do some projections. And you have to say, you don't know for sure, it, like we're not, you know, we're not omniscient, but we've done our homework. It just makes everybody's blood pressure go down. It makes them relax. And if you're competing for scarce resources in a larger organization, your project looks more like a sure bet than the people who haven't done this. I, um, I wanted to make sure that you guys know about two resources that I found very helpful. One is AJ and Smart. Um, if you go online and find their videos, they have all kinds of how to do design sprints, but we do good design sprints here in San Antonio and in the US. And if we can help you, we would love to help you do that. And then that whole napkin math business projections, there is a great course that is my uh, mentor, Ryan Rumsey, who I used to work for, is running. His organization is called Second Wave Dive, and he teaches UX people how to speak business. And I found that to be a game changer myself, personally. That's all I've got on this. Do you guys have other uh, ideas or questions? We got four minutes. <laughs> I actually have a question. Yes, ma'am. So this all sounds very interesting for a large corporate experience, but how do you contend with that with a really small business who is doing a specific project and trying to integrate this bigger vision with a small group? That's a great question. Um, I'll take a stab and then I'll ask uh, Tom or Judy or Susan to weigh in. The fundamental idea is to get anybody who could be an obstacle to the project at the table, or if you can't get that, then you do some drawings or storyboards or sketches and show the person who could be an obstacle and get their feedback before you've built anything. Because the earlier you identify the obstacles or the objections or the better ideas, you're ahead of the game. So the, the cadence is you need to get together, look at what has been happening, what you want to have happen. Then you ideate and sketch. And then you need to show it to people <laughs> and get some reaction. So. Um, Deb, you and I have worked on uh, a response app for providing support for pets who are displaced during an, a disaster. That's one of the things we've worked on together, right? That's what I have in mind with your question. Is that the one you have in mind? You know, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Um, you know how Red Cross has tents, like if a big flood comes or a giant blizzard, they, they would have like temporary housing for people or they would help feed people and 
house them when they're displaced. There's a, another group of people that have to house pets and feed pets. And then they have the additional thing of trying to match the pets to the, <laughs> to the people they belong to. So um, that's uh, what I would do is anybody who has ability to give you insight, show them the plan early and show them sketches because you describing things in a word document, they can form a different picture in your head than the one that you want them to have. Oh, that's, that's, an ex that's an excellent point. That particular part right there. It's easy for us to forget how easy it is for us to picture the right thing and how easy it is for them to not. So uh, it's worth drawing in some manner. The Judy. one thing I would add onto that is, you know, Susan, you mentioned you don't have to do a design sprint for everything, right? And so when you're talking about a small organization, um, you know, it really can be useful as a strategy sprint. So we use design sprint and strategy sprint a little bit interchangeably, but a strategy sprint can be, what is the next big thing that we're going to go do as an organization, right? And so you get the key stakeholders in a room to ideate, to, you know, put ideas on the wall. This is the next big idea. And then you can kind of have these discussions and fights and, you know, you know, voting exercises, even in a small organization, and then end up with a roadmap at the end of the session to say, okay, now we have a, you know, a clear aligned um, set of things that we're going to go do because we got all everybody on, uh, on board up front, right? So that's, that's a bit of a difference in a strategy sprint versus a design sprint, but can still be really, really useful to get those um, ideas and discussions out super early on. Right. And I want to add on to that is, that you know, a design sprint sounds like a big thing. It sounds like a big event. And so one of the things that we started to do um, in my last uh, position at, at USAA is we started to practice, you know, we were working with internal clients that were not familiar with the de you know, design thinking practice. And so when we, um, you know, when we did things, it seemed like a big event. And so it was like event based design. And so that was like the wrong connotation. And so what we started to do was have working sessions. So maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours, maybe three hours, but a smaller uh, event so that they, the business partners that you're working with become a little bit more familiar with the practices of human centered design and then they become more familiar and then they become more open because the other thing is they can see how uh, productive the time is uh, and the outcomes uh, you know better better productivity and better outcomes and then they see the opportunity for rapid development and rapid creation of solutions and so that would also be my suggestion in a smaller organization is you know maybe practice into it, maybe not bite off a big uh, sprint like a week long event, but uh, practice into with small um, recurring uh, working sessions um, to get them get uh, your your um, contingency familiar with that and familiar with the practice. And you can still do the same activities; they just don't have to know how you're carving it up. Doesn't and it, that has the, the kind of slip under their radar. They won't come sort of worried that they won't represent well or that it's a skill set that they don't have or any of that stuff. That's a really good point. Well, it's kind of funny the things that you all are saying because um, I actually have done that with my team and I got them to uh, test the difference between doing our, our intake process on a piece of paper versus doing it on a, um, uh, an iPad where I had just used a simple form. And um, after an afternoon of practicing and testing, they said, oh my God, without question, we need to go off of paper. So um, nice to hear that I'm- You're doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the right vein, so thanks. All right, any, any final observations or questions? I like to end this on time. I'm two minutes over. Well, fantastic I job. Oh, thank you. I wanna invite you guys, if you want uh, to be notified of future sessions, we have these every first Friday of the month. 
And it's usually something to do with user experience design, marketing, analytics, uh, that type of digital design. I invite you to go to firecatstudio.com and there's a, uh, a link that says subscribe to eNews updates or you could uh, follow us in LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And uh, my email address is showing here on the screen, susan at firecatstudio.com. I would love to hear your ideas for future topics. Not only uh, this group where we do the UX flavored stuff, but I'm also a member of UX San Antonio. They're always looking for programming ideas as well. So thank you guys for joining. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks.